Last week, you guys were on fire. We were discussing GW's best game, and one of you guys has won a copy of Tooth and Claw. Wait for a little bit later in the show, we'll tell you who won it. This week, I'm giving away two of these. This is Night Vault for Warhammer Underworlds, the next one after Shadespire. If you want to be in with a chance of winning one of these, be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And Lance has also told me to remind you to ding my dong. Yeah, we're busy with stuff too. So before we get into it, let me just show you. We're in the final run to building up to the Bolt Action Desert War boot camp. So if you follow us over on beastsofwar.com or on tabletop.com, they both go to the same place, you'll be able to keep up with some of the stuff we're doing. So we're building city tables. We're going through into what's going to become an old fort with a, a, a British encampment. And then the cool one, the really cool one. We've been building, and this is all vlogged on beastsofwar.com, we've been building a massive desert trench works. So whether you've got your bolt action or your Imperial Guard, I reckon you could probably have some fun on something like that. And then finally, about those comments last week, they were so good, we had to get a cat to tell us what you were doing. Want to know what that's all about? Watch the show. Welcome to the show. Did I mention that we're giving away Warhammer Underworld's Night Vault? Remember, to be able with a chance of winning it, it's easy peasy. Just get involved in the discussion today. Or just type, win! And remember to hit that like button and to subscribe. And you'll be in with a chance of winning Night Vault. If you want an extra chance, okay? Yeah. Now bugger this, I'm going to give away two copies. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to give away two, two copies. If you want to be in with an extra chance uh, of winning this as well, come on over to beastsofwar.com, set yourself up a free account, and come into this post on the, on the platform and post a comment there as well. And while you're at it, go and check out our project system, our places, yeah. Um, we have loads and loads of cool tools and great forums. You will have a blast here. I'm yeah, going to rate some games. We've got these gorgeous... Lance, show them the little stars that we do for rating games. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. It's cool. It's cool. Come on across. Right. Man, I'm going to show that picture again. We need to see... The Kill Team Cat. Bring up the Kill Team Cat. <laughs> there, is, there is indeed now a Kill Team Cat. This is the Kill Team Cat. This is <laughs> all the f***ing evidence you guys will ever need that mass battle is dying on its ass. <laughs> oh, that's a statement. It is a statement. Um, uh, to be fair, there are some caveats to this. Today's mm. discussion is about, um, is are the mass battle games dead? <gasps> now, I will preface this by saying, yes, we're basing we're basing our conclusions on your comments from last week. Mm -hmm. There is no scientific evidence for it, but it is a scientific <laughs> fact. <Right. laughs> Are we counting apocalypse as mass battle? Yes, all of that. Okay. The, the reason is um, maybe last week's question was a little bit loaded, but we did include 40k and yeah, Age yeah, of Sigmar yeah. in our overview last yeah. week. But what utterly surprised me was the the response. Kill team, kill team, kill team, kill team, kill team, kill team. Mm. Bring up the kill team cat. Because I know that every time we bring up this f***ing cat, we're going to get more likes than we've ever had on a video on Beast of War <laughs> ever before. So what, what else can you spot in there? Like, get, 40k, kill team. Team no. one now. <laughs> you know new. I see claw in there. I see... For all of much, guys, soul. will team one now. Rules. Rules. You know, it's... Um, let get 40k. I'm disappointed, Justin. Like I don't see look I don't see dignity in there new. or Warzan in there. No. It's um yeah, it, it's, it's so clearly whenever we put the call out as mm. to what do you think is the best game out there, you just gravitated towards Kill Team. And it wasn't only Kill Team, Lloyd. There was Kill Team in there, there was Necromunda in there, there was a load of guys that just did not get the question at all and went back into the annals of history uh, to pull out all the games that aren't currently made, the, well, the Space Hulks and stuff. We had that discussion before we went to filming as to whether or not to include those. And that's fine, that's fine. You know, it's, it all added to the texture of a wonderful conversation. Uh, but it wasn't the question. 
<laughs> uh, it didn't rule you out of the prizes, though. I remember at the end of this show, we'll be announcing who will get the... Is it Tooth and Claw, we call it? Yes. Tooth and Claw. Tooth, yeah. tooth and, claw. and Claw. Oh, you're going to be so happy. You're going to be jammy dancing like well, nothing else. Don't forget, it was either Tooth and Claw or their choice of the starter set. So depending mm. on who's won, it could be Tooth and Claw or something else. You're getting tooth and claw. <laughs> I've just checked. I've just checked. So the the thing about this is, here we are with another game. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um. This is a part. This is Warhammer Underworld. So this is the 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 next part of that. It's, it's, it yeah. comes after Shadespire. Yeah. This is Games Workshop's kind of um, their take on the ultimate kind of competitive play. Yeah. Game. Th this is our arena combat within the Age of Sigmar universe. Now the minis in this are lovely. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. Um, you you will find out more about that in a separate video because we can't show you any more of this than this during this particular video. <laughs> but we can still give away the two copies of it. Um, but I wish I'd looked in the box before I sat down. No. Has, <laughs> has the community really moved away from mass battle? Because surely we still gravitate towards having that wonderful. 40k army that just it's a shift we've seen in the industry though and something that i think we ourselves as a company may have influenced slightly is so many people play so many game systems these days these game systems have to be tighter lighter and easier to remember on the fly because if i put this down and don't play it for six months i want to be able to pick it up and remember sort of how to play and just have to refinesse myself dude i thought you were going to go for the triple and you were going to make it tighter lighter fighter <laughs> I don't know what you were going to put in there, but I thought you were, I thought you were going to come out with something just oh, no, my T-shirt level material. No, no, my, my, my tagline lining, I'm tired right now. I'm tired, so my brain is basically operating on about 70% power, so I'm just good enough to do an XL, a weekend or an XLBS, there's, there's, but you're not going to get anything super special out of me. There's definitely a trend towards smaller games, skirmish yeah. games, not War mass games. battle. And one of the things I've watched recently is on game days in here. Mm. We game on a Sunday. Yeah. Some people come in and they've never gamed before. Yeah. And they'll keep coming week after week, mm -hmm. but they will never. Um, what's the word? Make they'll the never. Leap. They'll never commit to anything. Mm. Yeah. Right. They'll look at a Kings of War army with like loads of miniatures, or a massive forty k mm. army, or whatever. You know those really big ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, and they'll never ever commit to it mm. because you just look at it and go. I couldn't yeah. do it. I couldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. But, the, but there's a, a intimidation level to that as well. There's so much to do. You know, but, it's one thing 40k tried to stop happening whenever they did that, that small scale starter that you could just expand out. And it's what they're doing with their conquest set at the minute as well. That part works that they're doing. Yeah. I think the likes genius. of Kill Team, I think, is a is a really good move. Yeah. I was talking about it a few, a few months ago when it came out. And I was like, oh, this could be the way in for a lot of people. Yeah. I don't know if that is. Oh, it clearly there's is. Been a, there's been a fella coming to the club for months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Never really committed to anything. I said, well, what about Saga? What about this? What about that? And his answer was always, well, I haven't yet tried enough game systems to want to actually commit to anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but just last week, there was a picture one up on Facebook. He's got the, he's got the, the, the. He went into the news agents and went home with conquest the, with, with conquest, mm -hmm. the first edition of it. I think that is a genius move. Having a parts works to get two fully painted armies on the tabletop. You have a nice staged run of development where you can get a big force at the end without realizing just how much work you're putting into. What does it build up to? Does it build up to kill team uh, armies? Or you, what? Get, you get two entire armies at the yeah, end of it. If you armies. look at the massive thing you get, it's like a huge space marine force and a huge Nurgle death guard force, I think. So, so it yeah. as well up, as terrain and everything too. Yeah. It gives you up towards a proper full on 40k sized yeah. army yeah. then, does yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. But they've broken but, it down into chunks that's acceptable. Yeah. yeah. Rather, it's, because I even gave the fella uh, a Viking warband. Mm. I had Spruce sitting around that I didn't need anymore. Yeah. I gave that to him. But this this conquest thing has been bought and put on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen if he's done anything with the Vikings yet. But it's because he's maybe been served that piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can tackle this rather than me going, there's 50 Vikings for you. Yeah. Yeah. There's but also th the investment of it. You don't see yourself spending maybe a thousand pounds on an army because it's only like, here's a tenner a month. Here's a tenner a month. Here's a tenner a month until you're done. I was, I was going to say, I think the thing, though, that's really important at this point is that even though a lot of people are seeing maybe, for example, Kill Team as this starting point for them to get stuck into a larger game of mm. 40k, they're not doing that. 
they're yeah. sitting and, and they're thinking immediately, well, Kill Team's a pretty awesome rule set, or they're mm-hmm. going, Necromunda rules, or Battle Companies is excellent. Mm-hmm. I'll just sit and play this because it's easier. I can go and buy another warband very, very easily and quickly. Yep. Yeah. Why bother buying a huge army when I can have exactly the same amount of fun in the 40k universe mm-hmm. playing something like Kill Team? And um, it's simpler to draw in a friend by saying, yeah, just get yourself 10 models, paint them up, we're off we go. Yeah, this is what I'm uh, what I'm wondering. It, it does, does Kill Team sufficiently scratch the itch you know uh, because w- what kill team gives you is it gives you um it gives you immense flexibility mm-hmm. you know because uh, creating your kill team war bands you know you're just picking picking bits and pieces from right across the 40k range yeah you know it, uh, creating kill team war bands is uh, is massively more accessible yeah, that... than creating 40k com- mm-hmm. you know uh, 40k armies that you're going yeah, to so... you're going to fully enjoy the 40k experience from. workshop have given you pre-built sets for the factions so you're not having to go out and buy like a thirty pound box and another thirty pound box to yeah. make it. So, if I, but if I bring like profitability into it, mm. you might think, oh, well, if they're not buying full forty k armies, Games Workshop will run out of stuff to sell them pretty quickly. Mm. But when you go down that route of going, well, it's easy enough to get a warband up and running. Mm. People will start going, well, I'll have this warband. Yeah, and now I'll have that warband mm-hmm. because. Yeah. And they don't feel like they're stuck in one army and have to keep collecting that army forever. Mm-hmm. They they hit a point that naturally, right, that's a big enough army for kill team. It sort of breaks down after that. You would be into yeah. 40k. I won't collect any more of that, but I will start another warband because I've enjoyed the whole process and yeah. I want all the flavors of trying different stuff. Yeah. The this... only thing I think is missing, and I saw it in another game recently, is an mm-hmm. AI system that would run an opposing warband against you. Yeah. Now, I saw this recently in Fallout Wasteland. Mm-hmm. It allows me to buy every single item from the range. I don't even need a friend. I can play it against myself. That was made for you, man. <laughs> the funny thing is, the AI in that game feels like I'm playing me. <laughs> I kid you not. It is what, what you mean? It's all cardboard. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to flip him off on camera. The hand went up, the finger was ready to extend, but I'm not going to do it. Oh God, Justin! Can you hear yourself talking to yourself in your plan? It's a way the game plays against cardboard, you. Justin. How dare you have done that? <laughs> That's so cheesy, cardboard, Justin. <laughs> I'll tell you what, play the game. I will show you how to play the game. And you'll see what I mean. How far <laughs> off? How far off do you think it is? Then do you know it's um, it, like does you know the thing about it is. Uh, does Kill Team, does anything in the 40k universe really require solo play whenever it's so massively available? I'm um, looking at it as a, as a good way to give you that excuse that you always loved whenever you had Warhammer Quest, to buy everything. Yeah. I don't think the solo so, thing is that important when you come down to like the Kill Team mm-hmm. because... Um, because more players can dip into it quickly. Mm, yeah. When it comes to solo stuff, like I'm going to veer off slightly. Um, for example, for myself, mm. what I find myself doing in the evenings is I just find myself making my army bigger. Mm. So I'm kind of bucking the trend a little bit. Yeah. Because mm. I've went into the saga, which you start off with a re- relatively small army, yeah. and now I'm just ballooning it out. So I'm kind of going the other way, where I've started with a small warband and I'm working my, my nuts off to make a massive army because I yeah. want a mass. Yeah. Army. I also wonder if the um, if the user base that uh, that followed is pitched at, uh, if uh, an AI deck, you know, and, and well, solo it's not play. An AI deck. Each car, each unit has its own AI card, mm-hmm. which determines depending on what its status is within the game, what it's going to do. Yeah. Well, the solo then, play. Let, yeah. let, let's say, did it did solo play become a kind of like a key component of that? Because Fallout itself is a fairly heavily solo played game Honestly, so in other no, words to appeal the fallout players who maybe aren't in the hobby i'm with you on this yeah they maybe but maybe that was a good move in that instance. this is well, an ip the, the game we played was actually a co-op game mm-hmm. so two human players versus the ai yes but, but you were yeah, still versing yeah. someone else rather no than... no no it was us playing I, co-op against yes the AI. But i mean you were i mean you and your your mate were against yeah. something yeah mm. But you I can't play you, a get versus your, game where it acts as a third player. I get your point on this because I think you're right that that versus mode against the AI very much sort of re- mm. recreates the video game experience for those who are used to video games Possibly. Yeah. and not having to go out and find another opponent, a real life opponent mm-hmm. to sit and actually have to have a game. Possibly. Well, you know, let, let's look at our industry. You know, it, or, or it's what I'm looking at here with Night Vault. Mm. Is this the, the the video gaming influence coming into our industry where people like when you're a video gamer, 
right? You buy the video games and the yeah. new video game comes out and you buy it and you trade off mm -hmm. the old one and you, you buy the next one. And each one is a self-contained product that you fully enjoy. Mm -hmm. And you're not wondering too much about uh, committing to a massive hobby. Your hobby is the, the video games. But this, I would say, yes. Is, this could be, is that, is that, has that generation now come back uh, or come into to our industry what is driving this if it's a desire to play a larger variety of games mm -hmm. then that, that's one thing um <clears throat> is it a desire to spend less on the I, games I, uh, I i think it's i think a lot of these games are a response from companies like games workshop and we're seeing it in other companies as well to people just not having the time to mm. do what they used to do i think yeah i think in i think in a society now where things are going quicker and faster and you want to do more stuff and try and pack more things into a day loving 40 40k and warmer 40,000 the world behind it and having a game like kill team to dive into is a much more accessible and enjoyable pros uh, process and prospect mm. than diving into 40k proper and collecting a huge army of space marines for example when you can do as we've said already just sit down and play kill team and the game is over in half an hour 45 minutes mm. it may and, just... and the fact and the fact that all the stuff that you're making is your own as well which is really cool yeah. so you've got your own characters and things like that i think another big part of it as well just to sort of go off on a little bit of a tangent is that in actual fact playing smaller games like kill team or warhammer underworlds uh, and and their games there like shades by and night vault allow you to go back to a lot of the things that hobbyists were enjoying back in the day that i think maybe we've lost a little bit more now mm. we're getting to do things like bits boxing and kit bashing and that kind of thing mm. just to add things to your force and whereas before an army for, you know like a thousand point army for space marines for example maybe was like 30 models 40 models now it's a lot lots more than that coming to something like kill team picking up 10 15 models painting those up making them how you want using yeah. things from other sprues and stuff a lot more enjoyable for a lot of hobbyists and painters as well as uh, gamers I on the so. smaller scales you really can go to town on the how yeah. you customize yeah. mm -hmm. um uh, an army with your conversions and things yeah. and some of this smaller box set stuff though um is um when we're talking about what's driving it mm. if you look at modern society we're very used to into training ourselves um instantaneously mm -hmm. yes. yeah so with netflix and amazon and stuff it's not it's not just that you can watch it instantaneously you can stop it and go watch something else mm -hmm. watch something else watch something else uh, you, uh, this is entirely correct because i noticed recently that i wanted to watch lord of the rings with my children mm -hmm. right and I nearly watched something else because I couldn't be asked getting off my backside to go and get the Blu-ray. <laughs> in fact, I nearly went to Amazon Prime and spent a tenner to buy the movie that I already had on Blu-ray because yeah. I couldn't be arsed getting up to go and get it. And I thought to myself, oh, but it would be so handy to have it on. Yeah. I have done that. I, I have bought disc-based video games. Mm -hmm. and then rebought it as digital mm. i was gonna say i tell you how lazy i have felt over, over, over the last week i was i was on holiday and we couldn't find the way to press play on the remote so i had to get up and walk over to the dvd player to press play and i felt exhausted every single time I did that. <laughs> so just how obnoxious we are now as dude as as dude that took you back like i remember as a child us actually oh, yeah. having to do oh, yeah, that i had to oh, do that i remember an old tv in my like, grandma's oh, you had to tune it like a radio yeah yeah so it it makes me wonder like it could just be a reflection of modern society i don't know if it's a good reflection of modern society in so much as it doesn't nothing seems to hold our interest for very long yeah. well that's, yeah. that's like when you were a kid you get like a toy mm. And you'd have to play with it until it broke. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Well, this is a discussion we had a while back about the lifespan of games that we have now. Mm -hmm. That cycle that people go through, they'll play, they'll dip into the world, and then they're off to the next new thing. Which this makes me believe you... that there's few companies out there who are better placed than Games Workshop to feed that need and yeah. to be able to feed that desire. And that's what this does. These guys are, are on fire. You know, this, this is an incredible the strategy. It. it gives yeah. you enough to have the same experience uh, amount-wise as you had with the first Shadespire box, but you could take this and combine it with Shadespire mm -hmm. and you're getting even, even more playtime out of it. But so they're getting you to spend more time with say, it. I was actually going to say, another aspect of this that I haven't actually thought about until just now is that I have been playing Age of Sigmar Champions, mm -hmm. right? And that is an ex an ideal way for me to play a 
the mass battle game of Age of Sigmar without actually having to buy any models. Oh mm. my like, god! Yeah, I, I've just been playing Champions and being like, I, I sat down to my friend and I was like, you know what? I can actually collect a Stormcast Eternals Force, and I don't have to buy a single piece of plastic. <laughs> I was like, and and do, the game do, again for that is over in half an hour. So but do you like, get do you get a sense of fulfillment from that? Like, I, yeah, I've got I, to I say, do because I'm ex- I do because I'm experiencing the world like. I love the Age of Sigmar world, and I think it's a fantastic thing that they've created here with the Mortal Realms and stuff. But I can't be bothered to buy all the all the models for it. Whereas I can actually say to myself, you know what? I can actually delve into the Ideneth Deepkin and try out an army for them. Mm. But now I can just do it in card form rather than playing a big, huge mass battle with See, game with loads of plastic. Pretty so. minis are a big thing for me. If the minis are pretty in a new product, I will generally go for it. E- e- even at a mass battle scale, though, would you say that you dive into something as big as Age of Sigmar if you love the armies? If, if you if love there the models was to make army an army that, for it, that caught so. my attention. I would go for a dip into it. I've done it before. I've bought starter sets into but, factions, but, but not went all the way into them. Yeah, but, just to have the pretty if, minis. But, but what if that army had something as like a small sort of side thing, like an Age of Sigmar skirmish or a Warhammer Underworlds faction? Would you prefer to just maybe buy that instead, well, rather than buying for the army? You have those starter forces in Games Workshop for each of the armies. Mm. Yeah. For me, if I see it and I love the miniatures, I'll grab that. I might buy nothing else for the faction. I might never play with it. Yeah. But if if the models are pretty and a starter set. I don't mind picking it up just to have them for me to enjoy the experience of building and trying to paint and feeling to paint. But the interesting thing there, I think, is that if you went and bought one of those start sets, I think for a lot of people, you might sit down and think, well, actually, I'm not going to really get as much out of this. Maybe you do, but I'm not going to get as much out of this because I feel I should I should be playing the large game of Age of Sigma. Mm. Where if you, for example, had, uh, let's just say for the sake of argument, an Ideneth Deepkin Warhammer Underworld set, that you could have bought and then say, well, actually, I can buy this and I can still play with it. Mm. I think a lot more people would get more out of that and that immediacy mm. than going and buying a box set, for example, and then not doing anything with it. So See, I, don't I think know. that's it's, a big draw for smaller It depends stuff. on the aspects of the hobby that you really love. For me, I have always my favourite part of the hobby has always been that initial buy moment when you buy something new, you pull it out of the box, you're clipping it <laughs> off the crack. screw, Plastic you're crack. gluing it together, you have the smell of the glue, you prime it, and mm. then it sits on a shelf. Yeah. You see, Games Workshop are well placed to do this sort of mm. thing. Mm-hmm. They have the infrastructure there. If we if we talk about um, fulfillment, yeah. do you feel fulfilled? Right. Um, I think you were going to talk about video games don't really make you feel fulfilled. Well, like well, well, a uh, lot of them can give you that sense of achievement, though. The thing about it is, it, it, it's about the, the, there comes a point in our hobby mm. where you will choose um, a deeper part of the hobby. Okay, so for Lloyd, that has become uh, Saga, yeah. and he's enjoying the historicals on that. Mm-hmm. For me, um, I, I, at one point, it was Flames of War. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, uh, for me, coming up soon, uh, and this is why I was aghast by this. I couldn't believe it when the Kill Team Cat rendered out, and, <laughs> and I saw <laughs> that. You know, it's um, to give you some perspective. Just once again to recap, bring up the Kill Team Cat. Kill so team the cat. Kill Team Cat was we took your comments. And we ran it through the Kill Team Catenator, and basically <laughs> what it does is it looked at all your comments and it read it, and then it, the words that were most used, it made big in the shape of a cat. How many times did law have to get used to make it in there? Law? L-A-W. It's right there at the tail. Oh, so it is. No, that's claw, Justin. Claw, uh, yeah, yes. it's, uh... I can't be cursive, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there's claw at the tail, there's soul, there's looking, there's recently, there's rules, there's AOS, there's make, really, dark, choice, mm-hmm. trade, uh, traders, work, way, armies. It's all in there. See, yeah. value. Value. Yeah. So uh, I, was, I was astounded by this. I was not expecting it to be so much more... Uh, popular but when the comments started to come in yeah. what i what i saw and what you guys will see if you go back and look at it is it not only there was a number of categories of people all gravitating towards kill team mm. there were returning veterans yeah. so returning veteran gamers who are all gravitating towards kill yeah. team that doesn't surprise me i'll let I'll, I'll come back to it in a sec but as soon as i seen the kill team box sets coming in mm. I, I i if i if i wasn't in the middle of a project i was very tempted just go and give me it yeah. give me it new players the number of new players that commented and said, "I'm just getting into it, yeah. I'm, I, I, and I'm loving, uh, I'm well, loving it's, Kill Team." It's that accessibility thing. You yeah. buy one box, off you go. You're not looking at down the barrel, spending maybe seven, eight hundred quid to get a force. 
this is what this guy I was talking about at the club needs to go into. He needs to go into kill team because he's mm. been holding off saying, I want to get into 40k. Mm. I wanted to get into 40k. I think I've said in passing in kill team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But next time I see him, I'll say, well, you really need to find someone to play kill team with. Mm. And then existing players. Existing players who never actually left, who have always been there, yep. seem to be gravitating towards kill team because it oh. gives them the flexibility of play styles yep. and a flexibility of collecting yep. that, that previously they and may not have had. It lets them cherry pick <clears throat> characters from their big armies that they may be already own yeah and yeah then that brings the narrative to the tabletop this guy from this squad he's a total hero i, well, I had him, me, killed him and he did this it's left me wondering uh, where to go because um uh, I, once we get the boot camp out of our uh, out of our hair um i've been looking to get back onto the astral knights mm. I have this deep and enduring love of the Astral Knights. Mm. And we have a we have the beginnings of an Astral Knights force here. And I want to get more into the background of it and uh, really look to expand that army out and and see. But I, it kind of shocked me because I was looking at it and, and I'm I'm still of uh, the mode of old school 40k. I'm looking forward to getting my big vehicles in there, Ooh. getting my diversity of it's units dead, in Warren. there. It's old dead. Oh, it's old dead. It's old dead, yeah. Dave. <laughs> Oh. What am I going to do? Are they going to pick five guys? <laughs> no, no, I, I think you can't say it's dead, but definitely the market has diversified a hell of a lot. Really. Is that, it that hardcore player base has been diluted? Is it temporary? Is it is it's, it a but, case? But of... is it game? Is it is it genre specific? Like, let's go for historicals. Has the big games died out of historicals? Well, Saga Saga played a part in in doing that, as did Bolt Action. It certainly stripped it down to about you know fifty minis. Well, well you go. Saga, both yeah. Saga and Bolt Action, I think, had a huge impact on the play style uh, within the historicals market. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, have, um, and you've got tanks. This yeah. is kind mm-hmm. of a pick up and go. Yeah, game tanks is very right, pick up and go as well. Yeah. But you do still have Flames of War and Team Yankee out there if you want to do big battles at fifteen mil. But that's a different kettle of fish because yeah. perhaps the different scale makes it. An easier proposition I, I, I to think get that's that the key. size I think smaller scale and less real estate of models on the table is the big mm. thing there. Like that, when you're dealing with that, you're dealing with handfuls of tanks, mm. not regiments and regiments of men. Yeah. I think is the, the key dudes. Thing, so. I'm imploring you. If you can find it in your heart in the comments to say, Warzan, you're not alone, man. Your desire to have land raiders and land speeders and predators and rhinos <laughs> all back on the tabletop is not abnormal in this day and age. We need to get you the new graph tank. Uh, I, I, I want to, you know, I, it makes my blood run a little bit cold if I'm it's, thinking that my astral knights will only be there and a group of a half a dozen guys doing their thing. I want to see the big ass see, army going out and I want to build it. I wouldn't worry about it too much because there's there's trends. Mm. You know, trends come and go. Like, let's say there's kill team now in these smaller box games bringing a load of players. Mm. Surely it's not hard to conceive that maybe in a few years' time they'll be like, well, I'm collecting more and more stuff. Yep. Now I need to play a game that lets me use all my stuff. Well, we were so, there. We were there back in 2000, 2008, 2009, because we we were all there with our 40k armies, and then Apocalypse came Bang, out, because you that. wanted to use all your models. 40k wasn't even big enough. Mm-hmm. Who plays Apocalypse now? Um, no, one. Actually he's group. Dead. no, no, no. <laughs> there but are Apocalypse. groups on Facebook. Uh, there was one, uh, John's friend Leiden. Uh-huh. I think they, we mentioned it ages ago, they had a a titan battle where their gaming space i think was about 13 by 24 feet yeah they did it so they could field their titans yeah they didn't do it so they could field a thousand miniatures yeah, yeah. but let's be honest apocalypse takes the piss yeah it does take you know the piss. it's like having a wee itch and cutting your hand off to solve it yeah. <laughs> it's like way over on the extreme well i do it, remember seeing it a, takes the piss in a beautiful way Lloyd. It yes takes the piss yes in it's extremely way. beautiful way i will never forget the time i bought nine drop pods but never underestimate the appeal of wanting a mass army mm. Yes, because right? everything I've got, like I've got Vikings, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm buying. So I've got like Vikings from uh... Mars. <laughs> <laughs> now I've got a Footsore Vikings war band. Yes, I've got Joms Vikings from Griffin Beast to do. Yeah, I've got some more Fireforge um, Swedish guys hanging about. Yeah, I'm kit bashing like twelve guys, and I'm, but I'm going to base them all the same because I'm going to pull it all together into one mass army. So like a, Viking, awesome. uh, like a Viking, like a Viking allied horde of hell. The yes. great heathen army. The because great I'm, heathen army. Because I'm yeah. building up towards it, and the way I'm building up towards it isn't going to have my 
my Russ army, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to have my Viking army, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to have my John's Vikings army, mm -hmm. but they're all going to be based the same. John's so Viking can, army. Yeah, John's, John's Viking army. John's yeah. Vi so, or John's, or what the hell have you called? It's Yom, Yom's. Yom's, that's Yom's. It. Yom's. I just call them Joms. I want my Joms. But anyway, uh, I'm going to stick the Yom's and everyone together. Mm. Well, yep. same base and style, but whack it all together and go, bang, there's my mass army. Because I want a mass army. I do. Yeah. And I think people who get into this will, will enjoy will, it. You think they don't get that? Eventually, they'll get that itch. Uh huh. Well, I do wonder do you know if what? the miniatures from in here have a corresponding profile in Age of Sigmar. That I don't know. Well, wait. No, here's the thing. They will right? do eventually. Yeah. The mm. itch. All right. Let's talk about the itch. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the grandfather. Uh, but, well, obviously Donald Wyverstone, but the, the younger grandfather, the younger and better looking and lovely grandfather of uh, modern wargaming, John Stallard, talks about the collector's gene, okay? Mm -hmm. That once the collector's gene grabs a hold of you, there is no letting go. But here's my uh, counter to your point, Lloyd. Yeah, they could buy Night Vault and they could say, I absolutely want to do Age of Sigmar on the big scale, okay? Yeah. Or... They could buy Night Vault and then just say, oh, I love that. And then they just buy the next Night Vault yep. and then the next Night Vault. And yep. they never gravitate up to the big army. But because Games Workshop keep making these, they don't have to. See, they're still going to spend money with Games Workshop. That, and the price point on these is just good. That's right. But they're making my Astral Knights redundant. See, <laughs> that, that's where buying into a particular world is good. If yeah. they keep doing this, mm -hmm. you will get fulfillment out of it. Because it's not a case of you jump from one game system over and over and over yeah. again. You can you everything that you've put on your shelf, you can look at it and go, if it's not one mass army, it's all one mass universe all and it all Sigmar. relates yeah. to each other. You also have the thing that what uh, Age of Sigmar explores within that universe is not the same as what this explores within the universe. Mm -hmm. I've said it before, the first time I read the story for Necromunda, it was a part of the world I had never really seen, never really understood the scale of before. Yeah. And that was a window into it that I never had. So as you get more into it, you're going to be curious about what are the other aspects of this world that my friends keep talking about and I keep hearing about. So that might tempt you into maybe jumping into the bigger battle stuff as well. This I, is your. I'm curious about how long my land raider is going to survive on the tabletop and how far into deep enemy territory I can get what to happened? piss off my Warren, opponent, man. You used to be the fluffy narrative oh, humor in here. You, the, the you sound land, better and cheesy right the now. The Land Raider <laughs> is the epitome of fluff, man. It is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. You've seen the ground um, tank, yeah. My worry about the kill team trend is that we start to lose the, the real beautiful landmark components of what made uh, these armies magnificent. And I want to see magnificent armies, guys. I don't want to lose the prospect of seeing magnificent armies. And it would be a crime for many hobbyists. Not all. We're not all in the position and not everybody's going to enjoy it. But wouldn't it be a crime for a hobbyist who to miss out on that when mm. they could just truly love it? But tell me, Warren, you don't want one of these? No, I don't want one you of these. You don't like those? No, no, I don't. I'm not What's a fan. That? I'm not a fan. I'm just not a fan. <laughs> I don't, I don't, give, me a, give me a proper Land Raider with tracks I'm any day. I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, you could be painting... Like the the skeletons and stuff in that, the ghosts and things like that. Yeah. And and when you get to the end of it, you're going, that was that's cool. That's a good result. I fancy a bit more of that. Yeah. Because you'll find that you might fall into a a comfort zone where you go, I know how to do this. There you go, and there's your baby. I know how to do this. And now I'm just going to do more of it. Look at that. Look at that thing in its beauty, and that's not even a pretty one. You get, you get even. Oh, just look at you it. see. Love that's how Raider. people end up with massive armies. Yeah, it's like they've been painting a color scheme. They're used to it. They know how it works. Mm. They've invested in it, and it kind of just snowballs. Maybe you go home one evening. You want to paint, but you don't want to stress yourself too much. You just fall into a comfort zone of, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'll just mm. move, just do more of that. Mm. Dudes, I'm passing it over to you. Right, this is the big topic of conversation this week. This just a simple comment could win you a copy of Nightfall. And we have two to give away. So remember, hit like, hit subscribe, come over to Beast of War, post a free comment in there with yeah. two of these that were given away. Because next week, I hope beyond hope that we will no longer have the Kill Team Cat. We will have the 40k big shiny ass army cat when everybody comes in and goes, yeah, Warzan, don't you worry, man. No. I want a big ass 40k army. Don't worry. I want a big ass it, 40k it, army. It's a cat. You know exactly what's going to happen. Just the biggest word in the middle of it is going to be no. Oh, no. But will it 
not be will it not be just a cat that says I want to win Night Vault? <laughs> the, the pick me cat. <laughs> pick me. But it's not only Workshop that's doing it. Let yep. me put this beautiful Night Vault away that you could win by simply commenting, liking, and subscribing. All right. Okay. It's not only Night Vault. Kings of War is doing the same thing. Yeah. Ben, time to talk about the news. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so the first little bit of news here is the one that you were just alluding to there, is that uh, Mantic Games have put all their pre-orders up for Kings of War Vanguard, which is the small skirmish-based uh, element of the worlds of Kings of War that uh, they have been. They took to Kickstarter not too long ago as well, actually. Yeah. Um, so some of the starter sets you can pick up that they've actually got attached to the site are the likes of the Basileans, mm -hmm. the Abyssals, the Northern Alliance and the Night Stalkers, which are a new faction within the world of Mantica. Although, of course, because it's Kings of War Vanguard, you can use models from pretty much any of the armies and just bung them down together, a little bit like Kill Team kind of thing, where you're picking up the, your favourite characters and using them for what uh, Ronnie has said in the video as the Black Ops of Kings of War. So the Black Ops of Kings of War. You're going to be playing as war bands of elite warriors that are heading out at the front of an army, like a vanguard, as you might imagine, doing the scouting missions, the assassinations, the destroying of supply lines, and things like that all of the stuff is up there for pre-order right now they've also got a free rule book download so you can actually check out the rules for themselves as well as i think it's maybe one or two different scenarios in there as well uh, so you can give the game a, a go if you want and then go and pick up the, uh, the the book as well if you want to later if you want to carry it on and stuff like that um, one of the big things about this is it's got a campaign mode built into it as well which is really cool uh, jerry was talking about that a little bit in the comments going through the, how that's going to be drawing people into it but yeah as we were saying at the beginning of this uh, this could be the another one of these big signs that mm. skirmish gaming is the way forward and uh, it's all this kind of thing is drawing people towards these smaller scale games on the tabletop because they add a little bit more narrative and add a little bit more story to the to the games they're playing and you get to buy the biggest ass giant that i have ever seen there is also a massive huge plastic giant yes that is a big huge plastic giant and i believe i can't remember whether it was kickstarter exclusive or whether or not it's actually going to be sold separately but there was also like a frost giant expansion oh. resin. i hope, so I hope it's like sold that, separately then, because yeah. the giant's like the standout thing for me and oh, it's, I love the I'm, I'm really it's just head and shoulders above here. the rest <laughs> look at this i am really digging this northern alliance stuff it's got a really cool style to it yeah I like the Yetis. I yetis like the Yetis cool. are very cool. I'm also going to say, for all those people that were complaining that the giant was too big, it's a giant. It is a giant. <laughs> yeah, it is a giant. How can a mind giant you, be too big? Mind you, I, too big. I can absolutely see us employ John into uh, getting an action man on a Barbie doll and uh, doing some sort of a conversion work <laughs> oh, on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't that bring us back to our... our careful, careful, ever? careful. We don't, we, don't, we don't talk about that. Oh, okay. We don't talk about Fight Club. The early days of Beast of War are, just, be of are, just, be are just between us and those that experienced it firsthand. <laughs> um, Toon Realms by Lucid Eye. Yeah, so uh, we've been talking a little bit about sort of getting younger gamers into tabletop wargaming and sort of role playing and skirmish games too. And Lucid Eye are doing exactly that with what's called their Toon Realms range. Now, I believe there may be a game in the works for this, which would be very, very cool indeed. But the vast majority of the models that you can see here are a bunch of characters and troops and monsters that you can use for playing dungeon delves, skirmish games, and all sorts of things like that. All of the models are very, very easy to put together. They're well. They're all one piece models, which is pretty awesome. And each of the models themselves has really nice big surface areas for them. So if you're getting someone started painting, yeah. these seem like a very, 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 very good idea. I for really that. like these. Yeah, they're cute. Yeah. I was thinking I these the would be very, very cool for younger gamers. Maybe if your family wants to get involved with painting some models mm -hmm. and stuff, these are a very, very good idea for them to get stuck into that and learning techniques and stuff too. It's also good for big kids. I really like the idea of painting up some of the characters for this. I think they'd be very, very cool, especially for use in board games and stuff too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Really enjoying them, what they're doing here, and hopefully we do see a game come out for this as well. Although the, it's not entirely needed, no, not every range needs a game these days. Exactly. They're cool. I like the style and the stuff, but I'm not. I, I find it hard to accept repeats mm. in, a, in a, if like I'm building repeats. something. But a child doesn't. No, a child doesn't. No, no. Like when we were kids, we had repeats in the Hero <laughs> Quest box, bo box. <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, and it never it never affected us at all. You know, we, we we're looking at some of these things through an adult eye. I'm going to talk tomorrow in the podcast. Mm. Um, about um, some uh, I've, I've I'm designing and, and working on an RPG um, um, dungeon crawling pro process with with my own children. I've got mm. some cool stuff to show you tomorrow mm. on that. But I'm I'm quite taken with these because of their simplicity. You know the the fact that they're easy to build because they're one piece. <laughs> 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 
I realise what I'd said exactly. <laughs> but that's how easy to build. You don't need to build. <laughs> <laughs> but the the one piece thing that does appeal to me mm. because you know little hands don't have the dexterity mm. to do that. Oh, one piece is great. Mm. So I get them, prime them, and then set them down with some crazy paintbrushes and let yeah, them exactly, chuck yeah. color on it. I guess for kids, yeah, but you can't get rangers that are one pieces and every everything's an individual sculpt. Yeah, which is like. Oh, oh just London, amazing! London does that, don't they? So yeah. yeah, and I'm and I'm with you on this, Ben. I don't think Outrange necessarily needs a game. Mm. You know, I, I'd be quite happy to to gather some of that what? and use it in in an RPG or or something yeah. like that with okay. the children. So one of the things that came up actually through social media and as well through the comments as well was a lot of people were saying this would be great for people trying to do an alternative take on Hero Quest. Yes, because they yeah. all seem like they'd fit into that sort of mold. So use them for games mm-hmm. of Hero Quest, and a lot of people were saying uh, over on Facebook and stuff that they're being using them to teach uh, Dungeons and Dragons and role playing to their kids which yeah. is very cool yeah, yeah absolutely. that's a cool idea um, Blood Red Skies Ooh. has um, zoomed over to the Pacific this makes me happy very nice stuff here Ben yeah, so we've got two, actually two new stories about uh, Blood Red Skies. But the first one is, as I said, as you say, over in the Pacific with some island hopping. And this is the introduction of the F4F Wildcat, which are very cool. Uh, so you've got a new set of these, which are done in metals, I believe, which is really neat. And of course, you're going to also have some forces for them to come up against. So you've got the Japanese with the Nakajima B5N Kate Squadron Torpedo Bombers, which Ooh, are very cool. Yeah. The interesting thing I learned when I was reading a little bit more about these is that both of these uh, planes were considered to be not very good ah. so it's it seems like it was all a comedy of errors for everybody when it came to the pacific and stuff like that i'm sure that ariska is going to correct me on some of these but everyone seems to consider that the nakajima kate squadrons and those torpedo bombers just weren't very good but they kind of did their job yeah. same for the wildcats as well one of the really cool things actually is that um, obviously blood red skies throws into the mix some ace pilots and one of the ace pilots for the Wildcats is Joseph J. Foss, who you can see there in some of the nice uh, artwork too. And he was in charge of what was called Foss's Flying Circus, so they made quite a name for themselves at the Battle of the Guadalcanal, Canal, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, some really nice stuff sort of going off in a different direction. It was very, very interesting, however, reading through the comments with a lot of people saying, oh, thank God, I can stop collecting Blood Red Skies because it's not in Europe, it's over in America now. And then lots of other people saying, thank God, they're bringing the Americans into the mix. So I, I can start, start collecting playing. yeah, Blood Red Skies, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, it, it, it's a super superb game it's a superb game we, we've had such a blast i with really want to play guys. well um, for, for me the excitement for this is we now have more uh, aircraft types so we can do yeah. mixed squadrons and actually start getting some different special rules on the go mm-hmm. so that's got the me other, excited yeah the other really cool thing as well is that they also announced this week that they're also going to be bringing out the hurricanes and the mosquitoes nice. uh, as well as a whole range of flying mm-hmm. aces for the british so if you want to get stuck into more of your battle of uh, Breton stuff You've got some really cool things coming together over there. Um, again, with like with what's happening with the stuff we saw for the US, we're going to have a load of ace pilots. So you've got some really nice character developing in these. And it also allows you to delve a little bit more into the background, mm. learn a bit more about the people and the personalities that were involved within this conflict and play out their adventures on the tabletop as well, which is really mm. cool. So. Awesome. Did we mention the hurricanes and the mosquitoes? We did mention the hurricanes and the sp- mosquitoes. I just wasn't listening then. I switched off. <laughs> yeah, we, we but the I, I made a boo boo. We didn't. I didn't bring up the second. Ah, oh, you didn't bring up the pictures, right? Yeah. Well, and so here, here's, here's the hurricanes. Your har- hawker hurricanes. And that looking really sweet with Douglas Barter. Yep. Ooh, swish. Is that not Bader? Batter. 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 Bader. He's badass. Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying this one. Witold Urbanowicz. Uh, that's re- that's really important because that's one of the Polish guys that came yeah. over to serve in the RAF and flew with the British during uh, the Battle of Britain. So yeah, mm-hmm. these are the ones that came over and took took names and kicked ass. Yeah, and you've got yeah. the mosquitoes. There's the mos- oh, The mosquitoes look fantastic. Now yeah, the mosquitoes are a really fascinating plane because they served a huge array of different roles during world war ii like i didn't realize because i just looked at these and thought oh they look like um tactical bombers yeah but there were more than that there were fighters they fought in the day and the night they mm-hmm. did surface things they did um a recon of uh things using photo- photography and stuff like that as well they were mm-hmm. a real workhorse of uh, the brits during the very cool. awesome awesome great collection there um specter mm-hmm. uh specter i think are going to make all my dreams come true because I think I'm going to get to play the original Arnold Schwarzenegger Predator. Oh. Because they've taken it into the jungle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. dude. Yeah, so this is a free supplement, and I stress flea, uh, flea, 
free from yeah. the guys at Spectre Miniatures. And as I, as you say, they're going to be taking things into the jungle. This particular uh, sort of scenario booklet, this supplement book, gives you additional rules for playing in the jungle. It allows you to play with new and improved equipment and stuff like that, as well as playing through a link campaign set in Nigeria between forces uh, from the West against the sort of Nigerian warlords in the area, which is really, really cool. Um, as I say, this is going to be expanded out with another part two, which will sort of tell the story a little bit more. But the really key thing that I think is good about this is that when Spectre Operations first came out, a lot of people were a little daunted by it because there was no real rules for setting up a, a particular force to fight on the tabletop. You yeah. kind of had to sort of play it by eye and sort of work together with someone else as sort of like a cooperative experience. This actually gives you force lists as part of the scenarios. So this will be a very, very, very good jumping off point for someone who wants to get into playing Modern Warfare but didn't quite know how to do it to begin with because it gives mm. you, like it says, take six men from this sort of faction and like kit them out in this way mm. against this these kind of insurgents and stuff. So yeah, it's going to be very cool for new players as well as those veterans. It's a good excuse to go and watch Predator again. <laughs> it is also a good excuse to go and watch Predator. Or there is the new one out. No, I forget the new one. No, I, I watched the original. I watched the original. Is it? Few. Okay, I've yes. not seen it yet. Just a few weeks back with the with my with Anna mm -hmm. uh, at home, right? And the whole way through the movie, she's like, "This is awful." This is a really bad movie. She totally made it to the end. Three or four days later, I'm upstairs <laughs> painting away, mm. and she's like doing the dishes or something, and all I can hear is, I ain't got time to bleed. I ain't got time to bleed! <laughs> 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 but, um, it, jungle, the whole jungle warfare mm. um, is such an incredible um, uh, arena to place um, a modern game in. Mm. Because, like, you know, uh, I, I saw it on the video game way back. Um, Ghost Recon. Mm -hmm. Ghost Recon did some jungle warfare that was really, really well done. Yeah, it's um, oh, I'm a big fan. That that is a big, big step. Right, welcome to the jungle. We have a bit of um Stalingrad. Yep, Ben. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, hopefully, you will have seen. Uh, Lloyd and John working away on a Stalingrad board uh, for Flames of War, which we mm -hmm. used in some of our Let's Plays and stuff. And the some of the terrain uh, for you to create your own Stalingrad is now available from the guys at uh, Battlefront and Gale Force 9. Uh, so they've created a whole bunch of ready for battle uh, scenery sets for you to use. Uh, and it's all sort of based around the idea of industrial heartlands and stuff uh, up on the Eastern Front. So you've got a brick a brick based factory there. You've got destroyed factories, rubble piles, if you don't want to make your own rubble mix, like Lloyd showed in the video. And of course, things like factory chimney stacks because i love the idea of verticality in games and having that sense of scale is really important as well um but yeah you've got loads of really interesting stuff there that you can just go and pick up slap down onto a, a gaming mat and get stuck into some flames of war as well the modularity of them is good though like if you have enough of them to be able to then decide i'll have a one-story building versus a four-story building yeah. just, yes you just yeah. pop them together and do mm -hmm. do as you please it's really cool yeah. and then do make yourself a bit of rubble mix it's really easy Basically, yeah. Go and watch the video. And check oh, it out. In the in the in, well. in the backstage video, yes. do you guys show how to make the rubble mix? And I and think stuff I like describe it? it and show what the end result is. I don't think I actually film me doing yeah, it. Yeah, but there is some detail on how to do it. Yeah, there's a there's a description. Uh, there's a description. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you so you don't bother watching that. <laughs> we, we, we need to get Lloyd to write up a rubble mix cookbook. <laughs> uh, I think it was pretty much uh, basically going through exactly kind of where you've taken them from, and then just showing the process of turning it into the sort of dirty terrain that you need for the gaming table which is cool fantastic cool. right next week as you know and if you don't you know i do we have a boot camp yeah. we are taking a bolt action into the desert yes and we are having a weekend of massive gaming and prizes and fun and entertainment mm -hmm. um so we asked um uh, Jim, the historical or historical editor, um, uh, to put together just uh, a little bit of a, an overview on on what you might expect. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to pass over to Jim, and then after that we'll be right back to talk about some Kickstarters, some prize winners, and the all important community golden buttons. Hello, beasts of war. This is Ariskany. Historical Editor for Beasts of War and On the Tabletop, and today's video continues our preparation and ramp up for the imminent Bolt Action Western Desert Boot Camp scheduled for September 28th to the 30th. Just to set a quick baseline in case anyone's not familiar, Bolt Action is a 28mm World War II miniature skirmish game produced by Warlord Games and Osprey Publishing. The bootcamp coming up will focus on some of the new releases they have coming out pertaining specifically to the Western Desert Campaign of World War II. 
Now, obviously, the North African theater was one of the major theaters in this global conflict, and at the boot camp we'll be exploring some of the campaigns and engagements of the Western Desert, and how these battles can be brought to life on the infantry skirmish level in the bolt action system. In preparation for this event, so far we've published a five-part article series that summarizes the entirety of the North African and Middle Eastern theaters in the Second World War. We've also had a Week Ender interview segment and a General's Table Twitch live stream, where we discussed some of the background context, high-level strategy, and what-if scenarios for the Desert War, and how the Desert War affected the overall course of World War II. Now, if this kind of strategic-level narrative interests you, I certainly encourage you to check out these articles and videos, and I hope you find them interesting. But in this video, we'll be focusing on the armies of the desert, narrowing in on that skirmish-eye view of the troops in the Western Desert in 41 and 1942. So we'll be looking at three major factions here, namely the British Commonwealth, the Germans, and the Italians. For the Allies, some of the troops we won't be looking at here are the Americans. American forces entered the Desert War a little later, with the Operation Torch landings in November 1942, where they fought in Algeria, Morocco, and especially in Tunisia, extending into 1943. Thus, they really aren't in scope for a discussion on the Western Desert Campaign. Now, if the Americans in North Africa is something that really interests you, we do have an article series we ran earlier this year, entitled Baptism of Fire where we took a 75th anniversary look at Americans fighting in Tunisia. Again, I encourage anyone who's interested to check out those articles. Also, for the Axis, a faction that we won't really be covering here are the forces of Vichy France. While Vichy French units were engaged on the Axis side and fought pretty heavily in places like Madagascar, Syria, and especially in their colonies in Morocco and Algeria, Again, we don't really see them engaged in the Western Desert specifically, so we'll be leaving them off the table just for this video. So let's get started with a look at our first faction, the British Commonwealth. When most people think of the British fighting in North Africa, they imagine the iconic 8th Army, the legendary victors of El Alamein. Okay, first, a couple of things. British forces here in the Western Desert were initially a much smaller unit known as the Western Desert Force. This was roughly the size of an understrength corps, with three divisions at most in its order of battle. Specifically, this would be elements of the 7th Armored, 6th Australian, and 4th Indian Divisions. Later, this would grow into the 13th Corps for battles in mid-1941. 30 Corps would later join 13th Corps to officially form the 8th Army that we all know, later in 1941. And finally, 10th Corps would later be added into a reinforced 8th Army for the battles of El Alamein later in 1942. Now clearly, from a Western Desert force with a strength of about 25,000 at most, to a full 8th Army order of battle with a strength of about, well, well over 200,000, we can see that these forces change out of all recognition depending on where you are in the timeline. So if you're interested in building a historically accurate or a campaign-themed force, consider just a little historical background just to get a focus on what units you might be interested in. Of course, Osprey publishes a fantastic series of books on the subject, or you can reach out to your friendly historical editor here on Beasts of War. He uh, just might be able to help you out. But perhaps the biggest misconception regarding British forces in the desert is simply that they were British at all. Well over half of them weren't. From the very outset, two-thirds of the Western Desert Force was either Australian or Indian. And when I say Indian, I'm including regiments and battalions drawn from the modern Republic of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Later, we would see brigades drawn from South Africa. New Zealand divisions were also present, and included some very tough regiments of Maori tribesmen. Free French forces fought through many of the toughest battles, including a legendary action at Bir Hakim and El Alamein, where a brigade of Free Greeks was also involved. Carpathian Poles and Czechs fought during the later stages of the Siege of Tobruk, and there's even a Zionist battalion of Palestinian Jews 
who fought beyond heroically at Bir el Helmat in uh, the spring of 1942. Now the thing to remember with these Commonwealth multinational units is you can build them in 28mm as British. They organized along British orders of battle, they used British weapons and British equipment. The uniforms were also largely British, although some regiments did use uh, different headgear to distinguish their regions of origin. These multinational formations were almost universally infantry units. Now sometimes these Commonwealth and multinational infantry divisions would have an attached armored brigade, usually built around a regiment of older tanks. This is because the current first-rate tanks were usually reserved for the dedicated armored divisions in 8th Army. So you can have these Commonwealth infantry and British tanks on the same 28mm table. Um, just try to make sure that these tanks are of an older model compared to the historical timeline of the battle that you'll be running. British and Commonwealth rifle companies in this period are built on three platoons, each with three sections of ten men. This is upgraded from eight men earlier in 1941. The standard rifle was the Lee Enfield, and each section usually had at least one Bren light machine gun. Three sections put together made about 30 men, plus a headquarters section where you would find a two-inch light mortar team, additional Bren machine guns, and depending on the date in the timeline, a boy's anti-tank rifle team. So you wind up with a platoon strength about 35, and three of these platoons would be bolted together into a company of about 115, plus a headquarters platoon. Four rifle companies, plus a headquarters company and a support company, are then formed into a battalion, with a bayonet strength of somewhere around 700 men. It's in these support companies that I mentioned is where you find the heavier 3-inch or 76mm border teams. Uh, you also find engineers, anti-tank sections, and these are usually equipped with the ordnance QF 2-pounder or 40mm anti-tank gun. For motor transport, we have a mix of trucks and universal carriers. Sometimes these carriers would be outfitted with the Bren light machine gun, or sometimes even a boy's anti-tank rifle making it technically the world's smallest tank destroyer. Okay, a Yacht Panther it is not, but against Italian CV-33 tankettes or Auto Blinda armored cars, you know, it just might be enough. I don't want to get too much into artillery or tanks here, since that isn't really the focus for bolt action. Suffice it to say that early war British anti-tank guns start off with a two-pounder that we mentioned earlier. Later in 1942, we start seeing the larger 57mm 6-pounder weapon, and finally at the very end of the Desert War, uh, when the fighting has moved into Tunisia, we finally see the first use of the 17-pounder. An interesting aspect of many of these weapons is that they don't start off with stocks of high-explosive ammunition, only solid-shot armor-piercing. This makes them great for knocking out German and Italian tanks, but it also makes them almost useless against anything you might face uh, in regards to infantry, artillery, or fortifications on your tabletop. I think later on some high explosive ammunition was manufactured for the 6 and 17 pounder, but in any event this is something to consider before taking them into your bolt action games. Artillery started off as the 18 25 pounder. This is sort of a hybrid between older World War I era 18 pounder howitzers modified to fire newer 25 pounder ammunition. This would have filled out batteries and artillery regiments attached to division or brigade units in the earlier part of the war, or in second line infantry divisions later on in the war. As soon as manufacturing output could manage it, these would be replaced by the superior 25 pounder howitzer. One huge advantage that this weapon had over German counterparts, like the 7.5cm field howitzer, was a much longer range, and this gave British counter-battery fire a much longer punch reach uh, in desert artillery duels. To go over tanks uh, very quickly again, because they're not really the focus here, the British start off with the Vickers Mark VI light tank. Uh, and the A-13 cruiser tank. For a much slower but heavier punch, we have the Matilda II, sometimes called the Queen of the Desert because it was practically invulnerable to Italian anti-tank fire. In these early battles, the British also made very heavy use of captured Italian tanks, 
uh, since desert conditions were very rough on the mechanical reliability of their own machines. Later in 1941, we start to see the A-15 Crusader IIs and the Valentine III infantry tanks come in. Later in 1941, these would be supplemented by the first heavy influx of American land lease tanks in the form of the M3 Stuart, sometimes called the Honey by the British. By mid-1942, the M3 Lee or Grant is coming into the 8th Army service. This is certainly one of the oddest tanks to see widespread service in World War II. And we wrap up with the Churchill Heavy Infantry Tank, used mostly in Tunisia after a handful of them uh, performed very well in the Second Battle of El Alamein. One last note I'd like to make about Commonwealth units in the desert is the question of special forces. There are two that stand out, the Long Range Desert Group and the Special Air Service, or SAS. The Long Range Desert Group started out first. They were mostly a reconnaissance and scouting force of desert survivalists drawn mainly from New Zealand and Rhodesia, at least at first. Their job was to scout very, very deep behind enemy lines, sometimes for months at a time, by driving hundreds or even over a thousand miles through absolutely trackless desert. Sometimes they would also strike a high-value target, but usually they were mostly, like I said, reconnaissance and scouting. They would watch and report activity on Axis roads, ports, airfields, and troop deployments. This would change, however, with the advent of the SAS. This is a much more uh, militant and commando-style strike unit, but for all their military training, they often needed the long-range desert group to get them through the desert, behind the enemy, and close to their targets. So, increasingly through 1942 and into early 1943, the SAS and the Long Range Desert Group worked so closely together so many times that it almost starts to become hard to tell them apart, leading to a little bit of confusion among uh, some war gamers today. We'll be covering much more about the SAS and the Long Range Desert Group in our Scorpions of the Desert video segments at the actual boot camp. Now we move to the Germans, and just like we did with the British, before we get stuck too deep into the weeds on the German armies in North Africa, I'd just like to spend a few minutes in general overview and dispelling a few common misconceptions. First off, the Germans are far and away the minority when it comes to Axis forces in North Africa. Man for man, they are always outnumbered, sometimes three, four, or even five to one by their Italian allies. The Deutsches Afrika Corps, or DAK, the German Afrika Corps, never mounted to more than four real divisions. In fact, it started out as just the skeletons of two partial divisions, 15th Panzer and 5th Light Division, later upgraded to the 21st Panzer Division. Later on, we will see the 90th Light Division join the DAK, and finally the 164th Infantry, along with some additional units like the Ram K Fallschirmjäger Paratroop Brigade. Another misconception that many people have about the DAK is that Rommel was in fact its commander. For the vast majority of its lifespan, the DAK was actually commanded by someone else, usually one of Rommel's subordinate generals. Soon after winning his first victories in Africa, Rommel's DAK was reinforced to become Panzer Group Africa. Rommel then became commander of the Panzer Group, of which DAK was only the central component, of course led then by another general. This would happen again later when Panzer Group Africa was upgraded again to become Panzer Army Africa. Another thing to remember about the German soldier in Africa is that he was almost always very, very sick. Most of the time, German units had a harder time with supply than their Commonwealth opponents, including, most importantly, water. German units usually had just enough water for drinking with any non-potable water then going into vehicle radiators. Nothing was left for sanitation, which meant that hygiene and health suffered badly. Dysentery, malaria, and jaundice are absolutely rampant among German ranks through most of the Africa campaign, and even troops who were fit for combat were often badly hampered by weakness. Rommel was no exception. His health was absolutely ruined by the desert and he was frequently back in Germany for medical care for a variety of ailments, and in fact he was absent for the critical outset of the Second Battle of Al Alamein. 
German infantry organization shows important differences from their Commonwealth counterparts at the very lowest levels. They have 10-man squads, the same as the Commonwealth 10-man section, but only seven of these men in the German squad are actually riflemen. Two more men make up a dedicated MG-34 light machine gun team mounted on a bipod in a squad support role with an NCO armed with a submachine gun. The volume of sustained firepower that could be expected from an MG-34 firing from 50, 100, or even 200 round linked belts at 900 rounds a minute is clearly much, much higher than anything capable from a Bren gun firing from a 20 round magazine. This is the cornerstone of the German squad's edge and firepower, and thus their ability to maneuver in the face of active enemy units. This is because this increased firepower means that the enemy is easier to pin down. When the enemy is pinned down, it's easier for you to move. More freedom of movement means more tactical options for flanking or assault or envelopment, and this gives the German rifle squad a clear advantage over its opposite number. Four such squads are put together, plus a platoon headquarters, into a German rifle platoon. There are three such platoons in a German infantry company, with one of the platoons also including a section of 5 centimeter mortars. Besides these three platoons, a German company also includes a headquarters section and a section of 7.92 mm anti-tank rifles. Three of these rifle companies are typically put together, along with a machine gun company, as you're probably going to be MG-34 machine guns mounted on tripods in the larger battalion support role. Um, and all of this forms together into an infantry battalion. In its headquarters and support element, these battalions are usually supported by heavier 8cm mortars, an anti-tank battery of either 3.7 or 2.8cm light anti-tank guns, engineers, and 7.5cm uh, or even 15cm infantry howitzers, depending on the unit in question. In all, the average German infantry unit, be it platoon, company, or battalion, is bigger, meaner, and deadlier than its opposite number. They have a distinct edge in firepower, maneuver, training in the NCO and junior officer levels, and in equipment. The higher up you go in the command levels, the more pronounced and compounded these advantages become. However, the great equalizer here is that German units are also chronically under strength. What we've listed above is what these units are supposed to have. Actual battlefield strength was almost always much, much lower. German units also had a much tougher time with supply. Fuel was a constant problem, and even those units that could take the field, as we've discussed above, were often very sick. German tanks and other armored vehicles are vastly complicated, and again, with them not really being the focus here, I'll just give them a very quick summary. When the DAK first arrives in Libya in February and March of 1941, we're looking mostly at Panzer Mark 1s, 2s, and some of the early 3s. The Panzer 1 is, is really barely a tank at all. It only has twin machine guns for armament and was originally intended only as a training tank. The Mark 2 at least had a 2 centimeter autocannon and so could possibly engage British Universal Carriers and Vicar Mark 6 light tanks. The Mark 3, we're talking about mostly the F variant, had a 3.7 centimeter anti-tank gun, which had proved more or less adequate in France, uh, except when they came up against the Matilda II. Finally, we see the early marks of the Mark IV battle tank, with the short-barreled 7.5 centimeter howitzer main gun. This is a high explosive weapon, and although not very useful against tanks, these weapons are great against infantry, artillery positions, trenches, and bunkers, which, frankly, you're liable to come up against far more often than actual enemy tanks. Later in the Desert War, the Mark III would be upgraded to the G variant with the L-42 5cm weapons, and finally the Mark III J, or the Mark III Special, with the L-60 5cm weapon. Now, it's the same caliber of weapon, but it's got a longer barrel. And the longer barrel means higher muzzle velocity and thus armor penetration power. But it also means higher recoil, and thus you need larger mounting mechanisms and a much bigger turret. By the time of Alam Halfa Ridge, 
we're looking at the longer gunned Panzer IVs. These are the F2 variants. They're finally arriving, followed by a precious few handful of Tigers that show up at the very end of the Desert War in Tunisia. As a general rule, German tanks in the desert were lower in quality than similar battalions, regiments, or divisions in Russia, for example, had at the same time. Russian tanks were frankly far more dangerous than British or American models, and so the Germans in Russia always got the better equipment. This left those in Africa to cope with basically second-line gear. Of course, no discussion of the Germans in the desert would be complete without bringing up the 88. As we all know, the 8.8cm Flak 36 was originally an anti-aircraft weapon, but its very high muzzle velocity made it an ideal weapon for engaging tanks when used properly and in careful conjunction with other weapons in your German force. Many war games make the 88 out to be some kind of wonder weapon, but we must bear in mind how vulnerable it is, how hard it is to conceal, what a high value target it is, and how in fact they don't belong to the German army at all. They actually belong to the Luftwaffe, or the German Air Force. Just something to bear in mind when you're taking them onto your table. And now finally we move on to the Italians. To my knowledge, we aren't getting any Italian armies at the boot camp, so I'll keep this part of the video rather short. Italian rifle units didn't have any mortar support like the German or British companies at the company level, although they did have two batteries of Brixia Model 35 45mm mortars at the battalion level. Italian machine guns at the squad and platoon level were typically the Breda 30. Now three of these platoons are built into a company and three companies are built into a battalion where additional uh, machine gun sections could be found. Even these, however, were really somewhat light. A 6.5mm in caliber, usually mounted on tripods for a defensive battalion level support role. Anti-tank guns were a mix of 37mm and 47mm models, although later in the war there is an Italian 90mm anti-aircraft gun used as an anti-tank gun much like the German 88. We do see some short range direct fire 65 and 75mm infantry howitzers used for close support in artillery regiments attached to the rounded division level. Italian tanks and armored vehicles in the Desert War are really not that impressive. From the CV-33 tankette to the L-6 light tank, then you get into the M-1339, the M-1441. These vehicles really are some of the worst used by any power in any of the western theaters of World War II. There are, however, some Semovente assault guns that are pretty good, including one armed with a 75mm assault howitzer that almost makes it look like an Italian Stug, but generally Italian armored vehicles in the desert war are actually pretty bad. In general, the Italian soldier gets a very bad reputation in World War II, and honestly, it's a reputation that's not wholly deserved. The Italian nation was promised that it was not going into World War II, and they weren't prepared for it in terms of training, doctrine, infrastructure, or industry. As a result, their unprepared armies suffered terribly when put up against better equipped foes. The Italian officer corps was also quite bad, with many positions having either been inherited or just outright purchased. Bad leadership and bad equipment is going to lead to disastrous results. When the Germans more or less took over the Desert War in 1941, they could at least partially resolve the leadership issue, and Italian units almost immediately began to perform remarkably better. This was especially true in fixed defense, where Italian positions often guarded the flanks or provided springboards for Rommel's audacious mechanized thrusts. Certain Italian units, like the Ariete and Littorio Armored Divisions and the Trieste Mechanized Division, really did exceptionally well even in the attack, right alongside DAK Panzer units. However, the quality of their vehicles and equipment was always going to hold them back to at least a certain degree. So that's going to wrap us up for now, Beasts of War, Desert Warriors. I certainly hope you've enjoyed this quick overview of Armies of the Desert. If you're going to be at the boot camp, I certainly can't wait to see you there. Otherwise, we hope to see you in the live blog where we'll be bringing you even more Desert War-themed content. 
In the meantime, watch out for those sandstorms, and thanks very much for watching. Thanks for that, Jim. Right, on to the Kickstarters. Stay tuned because we've got the Community Spotlight Golden Button Awards coming up, and we're announcing the winner of last week's competition mm -hmm. for the Warhammer 40,000 Tooth and Claw. And remember, get your comment in. Oh, I'm still here. Get your comment in. Like and subscribe because we're giving away two copies of yep. Night Vault. Um, comment here on YouTube and come on over to beast4.com. Set yourself up a free account and post a comment. Oh, I almost forgot. I have an apology to give out during this video. Oh. From the live stream. Uh-huh. <laughs> I am sorry that I forgot to turn off my phone. <laughs> my mum called me in the middle of the life. Oh, mummy always picks the good times to call. <laughs> right, Ben, well, time well, to talk some Kickstarters. Well, see, cool, I, okay. Just before we get into it, I am concerned that maybe the mass battles have died. Right. right. During that wee break there where we were listening to... Um, Jim. Jim. Yeah. Justin walks over there, he grabs the Fallout set and goes, look, Lloyd, look, it's only like ten figures, that's all you need to say. Seven. Think. Seven, seven figures. Seven figures. That's all you seven need to Seven super mutants. All that come with their own shitty base. In front of me going, you could be playing tomorrow. We have a, we have a <laughs> Let's Play out of Fallout. Yeah. So if you come across to yep. That's um, the co-op scenario I was yeah, talking about. Check out, check out the co-op scenario with the, with the AI mechanics and stuff yeah. like that. It works it? beautifully, I have to say. Okay. Lost Dragons, Ben. Yeah, cool. So the first uh, Kickstarter we're going to be looking at is for a series of 3D printable dragons that you print at home. So they're STL files, which is really cool. Um, so you can either print them at home or take them to a fab lab or something like that. Uh, this is by Daniel Herrera uh, from 3D Printed Tabletop. And they are creating a whole range of different and very unique looking dragons that you can use in your games, be they large mass battle fantasy games, but who plays those anymore, or in your role playing <laughs> games on the tabletop as well. Uh, for example, as part of the main pledges that they've got so far, you've got the Magma Dragon, the Ice Dragon, the Fire Twin and the Ice Twin, the Red Guardian and the White Guardian. So they've gone really heavily into both the Red and White style dragons that you might know from the likes of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. They've also got a very, very cool Kickstarter exclusive forest dragon design. And they're also going to be looking towards a whole bunch of other stuff in the future for a whole bunch of different styles as well. So you've got things like zombie dragons, uh, water dragons, plague dragons, and the like too, which is very, very cool. As I say, all of these are available as STR files for you to go and download for yourself. And uh, they actually run uh, a little bit of a YouTube channel where they talk about some of the, the sort of uh, the issues a lot of people have with 3D printing and helping people get stuck into it themselves and give it a go for uh, at home too. So if you're if you really, really like the look of these dragons, but you don't exactly know how you'd even go about starting to print them, they've got a really cool YouTube channel. And of course, there are lots of resources out there on the internet as well. And we have our own forums where we're looking to 3D printing too, uh, all to help people out with sort of getting used to the idea of, you know, getting these things down on the tabletop themselves and actually having to go with this new technology too. So, yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. So, there you go. Get that's, your dragons and a cool YouTube channel as well. That's awesome. You can never have enough dragons. Mm. Dragons yeah. are awesome because, like, love dragons. Best thing in the world. At the minute, I'm trying to fantasize my stuff a wee bit so I can take it into Kings of War. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking the Vikings. About, yeah, I was yeah. thinking about getting a dragon, but I got a cockleitch instead. Oh, you got a cockleitch, yeah. At least I think that's what it's called. I, I I was lying around the office there last week and I thought, oh this thing looks amazing. This is like a giant cock. <laughs> <laughs> With, fe with you know, with feathers. Yeah, yeah I know. I know a couple like of when I see one. I've had experience of no, them. A dragon meets. So it's um. I fought. Cock. I fought one. I fought one in a dungeon once. So did you have to stab him in the eye, Justin? I think, you know, I'm fairly sure time, it's a so. cockatrice. I oh, is it a cockatrice? Yes, I think I'm calling the wrong thing because Ben Google these like oh Google cockalich. Yeah, no, a cockalich no, is. Let's just say no. He no, didn't get what he wanted. No, no, a cockalich is a is an undead version of a cockatrice. Oh. Right. So it's a okay. so it's an like undead a version. Yes, it's one that it's one that the skin has started to peel off. You know, it's um. So there's no so, head on its like like its well, head's it, lost its it, skin and stuff. Yes, yes. How, how, how do you, you raise a cockalich? How do you raise a cockalich? You just stroke it gently and you say the magic words, man. It and works Calimar. every time. <laughs> oh, okay. Dude, I thought you would know how to raise a cockalich by now. I've never had that problem. <laughs> dragons are great. For me, um, my favorite <laughs> my favorite source of dragons is. <clears throat> Shrek! <laughs> They're awesome. I was Shrek looking at them dragons. last week. 
I love collecting Schleck Dragons. Um, I, every time I take the kids to the toy store, they think I'm taking them for them. I'm going for me because I, I always go straight to the Schleck stand mm. to see if they have another dragon in their range. I, I think I've got almost all of them um, because I love I love having uh, versatility yeah. in dragons. Well, because you, it's just, you don't just know amazing. you missed the Pokemon craze. I yes, select dragons are your Pokemon. Yes, I want to collect them all, Justin. I want to collect them all. Has their painting technique gone up? Because I was looking yeah. at them recently, going, "Wow, they must have robots digitally paint these or something." Because look at all the detail on this pre-painted stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. It's the best value dragon mm. that you are likely to buy. Uh, but already assembled, already painted. Mm. And a great size for 28 mil. Like, I mean, a really good size for 28 mil. Although I do like the idea of companies that are doing dragons for 3D printing because it's another way to have a look at this new thing for the industry and the hobby. Yeah, yeah. The 3D printing aspect is good. You know, I'm trying to get back into it again. I got severely disheartened with the 3D printing. Yeah, because... But- because it's hard. I, because I got it's hard and I got burnt and and I got <laughs> injured and, and how many times did you break it? Many times, but I didn't. I didn't break it. It broke. There is a difference. There is a difference. Operator error. It's but, not easy. But there's some amazing 3D printers coming along. You're I right. sent you a link recently where to the full color 3D yeah, printer. It's got like CMYK oh, plastics mm-hmm. and it mixes it and does full oh, color prints. That, and I, was just I like, want. I want. Oh my goodness! We are not far off, now, guys. We are not far off. Um, uh, the other the other uh, option for printing uh, at the moment is there's DLP printers now. DLP. So a DLP is a resin a resin bath. Yeah. It uses light, uh-huh. um, you know, basically like a projector. Yeah. Projects a layer at a time. Uh-huh. Okay. And we are now seeing those printers rocking in at, at under five hundred quid. Those are printers that are capable of printing miniatures, Justin. Mm. Like, I mean, well capable of printing miniatures. I do have to wonder, is there some form of chemical formula that you could come up for that resin that depending on what color of light you shoot at it would change the color of the miniature? You would need you would need a highly sophisticated resin that is photo that is photosensitive yeah um that that, that, that it activates would the that different be the next step what you would have is you'd have pigments in there yeah that are activated at different wavelengths yeah i have no idea how you would go about doing that but would that be the next step but i bet they could science it yo yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but th- that would be the next step for me is getting a printer that's that good and being able to put in a resin that just change that that color of the light or the laser or whatever. I don't know. I think I think color. I think Lloyd's printers probably got more chance. You know, your kind of additive printer, yeah. I think so. the, the the FDM, um, because you you just load in you just load in your three colors mm. and it and it mixes it and, and prints it out. You know, the the key to that is to get the to get the actual mechanics of it. Well, it's, to work it's, to it's give you the fine enough to, resolution. To mix and feed at the correct rate that's the easy bit it's but it has to mix the exact right amount for each component that it's printing yeah it's ready to but that's what it's doing but inkjet printers are already doing all that and that's really? why i think that's the route to go because people know how inkjet printers work justin you you, you have printed something on an inkjet yes, printer yes yes you can print photographic quality on an inkjet printer yes we know how to mix colors mm. what 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 we haven't cracked just yet mm. is uh, getting the getting the mechanics of the system mm. To allow us to print without that layering, you know, to so get that yeah. resolution mm. down to be fine enough to, to get the layering. But See, with it being printing a 3D object, I'm thinking the mass of each component, it has to be mixing and sending that through at the right rate. As soon as if something goes off in that, it's gonna you're gonna have hands that have got color bleed through them. No, you're not. Well, y- yes, you, you are, Justin. Thinking? But you ha- you have to understand that. Um, a computer's brain and your brain are not not quite the same. Okay. Mm. In the time that it takes you to blink, yeah, right, a computer will have uh, maybe run a million calculations. Right. Okay, so it, it 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 the the speed at which a computer can work these things out mm. is just incredible. So mm. if you can build the intelligence into the print head, yeah, it'll know exactly how much it needs to pull through. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah, it, it's not easy. I think it's, but uh, it's not impossible. But it's already doing it. I mean, let's talk about let like. Right, so if computers are going to be able to drive us around in cars, yeah. they're definitely going to be able to print stuff in cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, they, and they're already they're already doing these basic calculations inside mm. inkjet printers and laser printers and stuff so already. So they're already 
scaling that. It's, to it's a level. matter of taking the same kind of thought process. Mm -hmm. There's material science in it because yeah. you need to make sure that you can get materials that will actually mix yeah. with one another. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the real key to this, uh, from my perspective, and this is the thing that isn't being sold quick enough mm. in the FDM printers, is the 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 resolution we need higher higher resolution uh, i don't know what's going to be for the actual mechanical that. moving yeah so that we get minis that look like minis and they don't look like mm. full of stepping and yeah well stuff. i do remember john ordered a thing for a world of warcraft character of his yeah he took the 3d model and sent it off to a company and they actually mm. did 3d print a full color version of his character it was probably done in the resin bath because you get much higher resolution um, that way so all that stuff from hero forge and the likes yeah that's all done yeah, using... this, this was the pre-color thing this was years ago but the the colors were not solid there was bleed oh through. i see yes yeah yeah, yeah so, so it came to him fully colored mm -hmm. but we're, we're, we're kind of in the dot matrix sort of realm mm -hmm. at the minute mm -hmm. yeah we're getting there it's, it, yeah, it yeah, is yeah. getting there it is getting all right there. Kickstarter next up next up we have the lost minis this kickstarter Ooh. is really really piquing my interest is cool. this a home for all of the minis that we've never used? Yeah, so this is the Impact Miniatures guys who are working with a whole bunch of different companies and 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 failed Kickstarters and all kind of things like that. And all of those ranges that were promised that never really came to light, maybe there were things that were done way back in the annals of time in Pewter and they never came to light because the sculptors just couldn't get them done. This Kickstarter is aiming to bring those to life. Mm -hmm. So this is over a hundred, I think, at the moment, miniatures from a whole bunch of different Kickstarters, uh, producers, companies that have closed and all kinds of things like that, now brought back to life through this. Now, they were only looking for a very, very small goal. They're already way, way past that now. I think it was $500 and they're up to like 3600 yeah. now at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this is looking very interesting. And it means that all those projects that maybe never got off the ground, Impact Miniatures are trying to give them a home. Because, of course, a lot of these maybe came with a game or like a board game or something like that, like a, a big war game or something. But these are sort of just stand on their own miniatures that you could just pick up and they'll be very, very unique for your collection. So if you like the idea of picking up some stuff from either the worlds of fantasy or sci-fi, this might be something you want, might want to go and have a look at because you can, either get, you can either sort of dive in all the way and get all the models or sort of pick and choose if you want to know, which is really cool. So it's a big variety pack. It's just a massive variety pack of models from all over the spectrum. And as I say, they're all going to be very individual. So, you know, if you want something that's going to look very, very cool for your own character in a role-playing game, this might be something that you might want to go and check out as well. So, yeah. Isn't that interesting? That's kind of cool. But there's a reason these models died in the first place. Mm. But, you know, it, this, is, this is the beauty of what the world is unlocking for us. Both the technology and funding processes like Kickstarter are unlocking niche opportunities like this that something like that could exist. And so you know it doesn't matter what you know why the, why the models disappeared the very fact that people can actually get them i think yep. it's great it's great it's niche of the niche of the niche i love it exactly uh, i'm having a look at the way they've actually laid out their pledges here which mm -hmm. i completely agree with for this type of kickstarter so depending on which level you're picking that's money towards x number of miniatures and then they've got the pricing on each set of miniatures mm -hmm. so this is very much what you can pick feels, and choose what you want yeah, yeah it feels like that you know the way in some game stores you get that bargain bin yeah mm -hmm. that's what this feels like but wait me. now are they actually supplying you physical miniatures yes from what yes. i can see here yeah but th this feels like that bargain bin you have it sounds some like a lot source. of work it mm. sounds like a lot of work i yeah the management for it's it, maybe going to be a bit of a uh, that would that would that would be a warning warning light for me like if you've got well over a hundred odd miniatures and the picking process uh, yeah, the, yeah the, but the, the these whole... are not things that they're they're having to create maybe these are things that already have molds and stuff made Possibly. and ready to go Possibly. i will also say that impact have actually run quite a few kickstarts at this point and All as right. far as i know most of them have delivered and they've been okay oh, um, then, there we go. i'll put a caveat yeah. on it for you to yeah. do a little bit of research but mm. it's worth looking at this one especially if you see something that looks really cool from like the space space always be careful always be careful yeah, space worms they look awesome right <laughs> um deep pit games have brought tuned to kickstarter uh -huh. now um I'm, I'm really quite taken by the artwork on this ben yeah, what can you yeah, tell us about it 
so this is a really cool little game that's come out from Deep Pit. Uh, Deep Pit. It's just come funded at this point as well, which is really cool. And the idea is that it's a dungeon delving style adventure, but with a little bit of a twist because it's for two to five players where you're, it's set during sort of like the 40s period. So it's a little bit more like Indiana Jones than mm-hmm. it is like a fantasy dungeon crawl that you might be familiar with. Yeah. The other really cool thing about this that I thought was really neat is that I love the kind of cartoony style to the miniatures. Of course, they're not going to be like as high end as a lot of them that you might yeah. have seen out there as well. But there are some really neat and interesting mechanics into this mix that really sort of drew it to my attention nice. and maybe want to show it off mm-hmm. here as well. I, again, once again, you know, be careful with Kickstarters, of course. Mm-hmm. But this one did look really, really cool. Um, one of the really interesting things is that they've really gone for this idea of replayability uh, because every time you sit down to play this, the Pharaoh is going to be making some very interesting st- uh, choices as to how they build their pyramid and depending on, depending on the couch that you bring to the pyramid to go delving for the treasures in the tombs and stuff that will dictate what they can do and sort of what they can spend their time building up as which is really really cool the other awesome thing about this is that when you're playing through the different scenarios the actual map itself changes like one of the tombs you might see in like indiana jones or the mummy oh yeah so rooms can disappear and slide around doors mm-hmm. can shut and lock cre- uh, lock your characters inside them so you really really get to play around with this idea of being this malevolent overlord this pharaoh character in the background when you play this game the other really cool thing about this as well is that yes there's this sort of like one versus many thing going on so you've got the pharaoh versus the players mm-hmm. but they've also thrown into the mix some really nice scenario and cooperative adventures as well so if you want to get in, stuck into on that side of things there's also some options there too but yeah give this one a check um have a look through some of the gameplay stuff they've got there written out on their kickstarter as i say the i think the really neat thing about this that drew me to it was the idea of the pharaoh being able to change the board and play around with the layout of stuff so they can trap people that might necessarily might not necessarily mean that the game itself is very good as a whole but that neat little mechanic was enough to sort of pique my interest and maybe it can be translated into something else in the future as well which is really cool so yeah go check it out Okay, next up to my favorite part of the show, um, it's Community Spotlight. This is the opportunity where we get to look through our forums <coughs> and our project systems, mm-hmm. both of which are free. Create a free account and you can manage your projects, uh, mm-hmm. all of your hobby projects uh, via uh, on tabletop.com. Um, so we pick the best, well, we pick what we like in any given week, mm-hmm. and they get a golden button. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who's getting um, the golden button this week, Ben? Okay, so before we dive into this, I just want to say I would really love to see a lot more uh, professional artists and sculptors and things using our system. So if you know anyone that's in the industry, maybe they're a small company or something like that and or whatever, get involved with the project system and show off how you sculpt your miniatures, mm-hmm. how you bring come up with game ideas mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I think it'd be really, really fun to see not only just the community members, but also people in the professional industry working on this too and sort of showing off what they're doing, especially because it allows you to have this really nice immediate feedback about stuff. So if you're interested yeah. in showing some stuff off, this that could be really, really cool. I, I think this is going to be cool. Nightmare Goblins. Yes! Oh, I love nice. them! <laughs> they're great! <laughs> Uh, so this is Subadai, who is painting up some amazing looking uh, goblins here from the guys at Nightmare Miniatures. I thought these were absolutely fantastic. Now, you know, I love my old Hammer stuff. I yep. think it's fantastic. I love going back into that kind of retro style of these. They they sort of live and breathe old school Warhammer fantasy artwork in these pieces. And I think the way that he's painted them is absolutely fantastic. I love the horrible sort of nasty bone that's attached to these creatures. The d- sort of not black that's been done for the robes, which is really nice, giving them a kind of night goblin feel. And then, of course, the actual goblin textured skin that he's gone for is really, really good, too. Yeah. He's gone for this almost deep green, then lit by the lighter green at the top to give them this idea of, like, cave dwellers, which I thought was really cool. And then when you see it sort of brought across the model and that really nice contrast between the dark and the light, just some really, really fantastic for looking anybody watching, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. anybody watching, we clicked into the project and we hadn't realized it's a just bit of a mishmash. how much work he has done in this project. Here we go. His yeah. project is like a collection of his fantasy stuff. Yeah. 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 So he has also done a lot of stuff for like Tomb Kings and all kinds of things like that as well. But the most recent project that he was working on with these goblins, and I just I I'm in a bit of a goblin mood. I'm loving goblin quests. You're goblin and stuff, so yep. Seeing these was very cool. Oh so, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, congratulations, Subadai. Well earned Lovely golden work. button on that one. Okay, next up, um, we have uh, J R Aldridge, and this is Seven TV Apocalypse Vehicles. This is cool too. I look oh. at this. Yeah, so oh, this is yes. just, 
Yeah, so this is just going back to some really cool kit bashing and sort of bringing together what we love from the like the idea of things like Gaslands and mm -hmm. what the 7TV apocalypse is all going to be about. Taking those really cool sort of 20 mil matchbox cards and stuff and then turning them into something awesome for your gaming table. So as you can see here, one of the first images is that fantastic lorry, that massive freighter that he's been working on there, which yeah. is really cool. I love the fact that this was effectively a toy to begin with and now he's turned it into something epic for the gaming table. And as you go down through, you'll see how he He's been using lots of bits and pieces from a whole bunch of different ranges. I believe some of these are actually from Crooked Dice's own uh, Apocalypse sprues. Yeah. So they provide you with a whole bunch of things like meshing and armor plates and gun turrets and stuff, which is really, really cool. Of course, there are other companies out there that are doing similar things. So Ramshackle Games, I believe, or Ramshackle Miniatures actually produce a range of uh, bits and pieces like this that you can use to add on to your matchbox cards and stuff to create them into these sort of weaponized urban, uh, weaponized uh, post-apocalyptic yeah. um, vehicles that you see here, which are really cool. Perfect. And then as you see towards the bottom, you can see the fact that he's got a whole bunch of toy cars that cars there, as well as some bits and pieces. I believe these old uh, ones on that, that pink cloth are from uh, Gorka Morka, I think. Yeah, the uh, but yeah, he's been, yeah. yeah, he's been diving into lots of bits and pieces there, as you can see, and sort of using them to sort of embellish his vehicles and stuff too. So yeah. A really nice thing to see that people are delving into the post-apocalypse and creating some fantastic stuff for their own uh, edification and stuff, which is really mm -hmm. cool. There, so, fantastic. Yeah. A man after my own heart as well. I love Super buying. Um, I've found a great source for um, what I consider to be cool 28 millimeter scaled um, articulated lorries. Mm -hmm. um, ah. uh, I've found a, a local um, a cash and carry that's uh, selling off some toys but they're still 13 14 quid a piece mm. but it's not too bad but i just don't have a project in mind at the moment that's coming up uh, to warrant buying them right will we announce our winner yeah okay before i do that remember <laughs> oh! why do you keep putting it so far away I should have just left it there, man. We're giving away two copies of Night Vault. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to be in with the chance of that, remember all you have to do is comment. There's plenty you could comment about on this yep. particular video. Remember to hit like, hit that subscribe. And hit the bell. Oh, yeah, hit the ding, ding my dong. dong. Ding <laughs> my dong. Remember to ding it, man. Um, and then come across to Beast of War. Um, dot com or on tabletop.com it all comes to the same place of awesomeness and create yourself a free account and post a comment in there as well yep. and we do read the comments and we do reply to most or some of the comments if it, if it wants a reply we'll do our best to, to get stuck in there right last week we were giving away tooth and claw and our winner on youtube was a d a d a d that's it, just A, D. A space just D. Just A space D. Um, <laughs> uh, all you have to do now, dude, is come across to on tabletop.com, mm -hmm. click the contact us button, no, click the more button, and in the contact us column of that drop down menu, you will see claim a prize. Mm -hmm. So get in touch, um, claim a prize with us, or reach out to us via message on YouTube, claim your prize. Give us your address as soon as possible before Tooth and Claw sell out, and we will get a copy of it bought up and sent over to you. And it would be absolutely our pleasure to do it. As soon as possible. As soon as possible. Um, right, guys, next week, no weekenders, because we are doing Bolt Action Desert War Boot Camp. Yes. I'm excited. Yep, uh, so coverage should kick off on the Friday. Yep. Uh, run yeah. through Saturday and Sunday, where everybody's going to be playing a lot of great 28 mil uh, games of bolt action in the desert. Absolutely. So uh, come on over, get stuck into that. We're going to be giving away some prizes. We're going to be doing all the usual fun and games that we do during a boot camp. A boot camp isn't just about the people that here. It's about us and you as well. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Lloyd and Justin and Ben for joining me this morning. Come and join us tomorrow for the XLBS podcast. Um, I think we're going to have Justin yourself. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll have Ben back. Yeah. Um, we'll get Sam in it. Give me John. I want John. Right, we'll get John in it as well. And I've, I've, I've... John and Justin to go. John. Yeah. And I've what? Got... I've named you John. And no! I've... <laughs> and I've got a good hot topic for us to yeah. discuss. I've got a good hot topic for us to discuss. And it's related to historical war games. Perfect. We have John. We're safe. Okay. Nice. Right. Come across, if you haven't done it already, join Backstage, join us in the Weekend Podcast, and we will see you there. Until next time, have a great week of gaming. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now, and be sure to check out beastofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, 
why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.